that you're here with us today. Let's stand together. Um, we're going to sing a couple of songs before announcements and our uh, sermon today. But um, I just want to reflect on who God is, and how great he is. Um, just the gift that he has given us, the ability to be able to be with him in eternity for those who believe in the death and resurrection of his son. Um, just how powerful that is. So let's stand together. I'll pray for us and then we'll begin singing. Lord, we're so grateful for you. And we thank you for your gifts uh, and your love that's unconditional and unending. And I pray that we will uh, have uh, open hearts and minds to experience what you have for us today, Lord. Thank you again for your love. In your name we pray. Amen. Great is thy faithfulness, O oh God, my Father. There is no shadow of turning with thee. Thou changest not thy compassions, they fail not. As thou hast been, thou forever will be. Great is thy faithfulness, great is thy faithfulness. 
You may take your seats, and kids can be dismissed into the foyer to be taken to kids' church. Hey, good morning, Seed Church. I'm John. I'm an elder here. If you're on Zoom, we welcome you. Maybe there's some Parkers from South Florida out there. I'm claiming from home. Hey, buddy. Um, if you're new, uh, welcome. Uh, we are a church of prayer, uh, and we, we are praying. Uh, everything, all the prayer requests that have been coming in, everybody has a card on their chair. We also have an email address, prayer at dyingtolive.org, and we are lifting up and making a concerted effort to be in prayer over the needs of this church. Uh, you as individuals, the things going on in our lives, the things that are going on on a larger scale, um, and the elders are praying over every request. Every time we meet, and our prayer team is diligently praying on Tuesday nights on Zoom, but you're welcome to join. And so, um, please, if there's stuff we can be in prayer for uh, over your life about, uh, we want to know about it. We want to pray for you, and we invite you to join us in praying over those things as well. Um, and gosh, it's been awesome. Uh, there's so many, so many great things that we've been praying over, and so many great answers uh, that we've heard as well. Um, so I'm just really excited to continue this um, going forward. Uh, the women's studies have kicked off. There's a couple of them, so I'm really excited that that's going on. Um, a few weeks ago, we, we as SEED, we tithe 10% of all of our giving back out to missions, and that's just our minimum. So often in the past, we've had special fundraisers and different concerted things that we do, but no matter what, we send 10% of any, anything that comes in back out into missions. And one of those uh, organizations that we support is Hand in Hand. And I just wanted to read the thank you note from Hand in Hand uh, for our donation. Dear C Congregation, your generous gift of $2,000 arrived today. Wow, thank you so much for the impact that it will make excuse me, that will be made to the children and families in crisis. God continues to answer prayers in, in this season, and he is faithful. Thank you again for your gift, and please keep our team and families in your prayers. Blessings, Alice, from hand in hand. Uh, what a wonderful thing uh, that as we give uh, to the Lord here, uh, we're able to reach out and support other critical missions that are happening in our area, also internationally with AJS, a justice mission. Uh, so really, really cool. Thank you for faithfully giving, and I hope you're encouraged like I am that we're able to bless these other organizations and support what God's doing through them. I announced last week that uh, we have a winter intern coming, my nephew Isaiah Parker. And uh, so I want to invite Isaiah up 
to just introduce himself and some of the things that are planned for his stay here. And it's a, it's a crime that we uh, were masked because of my beard and his mustache. Um, it's, it's genetics, uh, good genetics, but. Yeah, thank you. Um, so I'm just gonna do a quick little introduction about my background and stuff and what, what we're excited about doing here. Thank you first off to all of you guys for, for sponsoring me and for bringing me here as an introvert for the winter. I really appreciate it. I'm really excited for what we're doing. I moved here from Southwest Florida, the Fort Myers, Florida. I don't know if any of you are familiar. So literally across the continent to, to get here. Um, yeah, we're gonna be doing outreach um, while we're here. So, or while I'm here, we're gonna be doing outreach. The hope is that we can create the kind of building blocks here at SEED to outreach to this community. As a church, we should be super concerned and we are super concerned about our next door neighbors, right? Especially during this trying time. So we're gonna be doing some cool stuff, uh, we'll, which we'll announce future, I'm sure uh, Bart and my uncle John will announce uh, soon. One of the things we're gonna start immediately here at the church, and this is for the congregation and for anybody who's interested, is hopefully next Sunday, it's still in the works, but hopefully next Sunday, we're gonna start an apologetics 101, an introduction to apologetics course on Zoom that anybody can come in and meet and we'll get that, we'll get all the information for the Zoom meeting announced for you guys uh, next Sunday. And we're just going to go over the basics, like how do you explain your faith to somebody who completely disagrees with you, right? Is the Bible trustworthy? How do you explain that God exists? What about the problem of evil? Those are the kind of things that we're going to be discussing and we're going to be going over. It's going to be an open Q&A and discussion format. So we'll do a little bit of content and then you guys can ask questions and we'll discuss it. So we're really excited about bringing that immediately uh, to the congregation. And then we have some other outreach specific stuff that we're going to be working on in the coming weeks. Um, just so you guys know, I graduated from Liberty University last year with a degree in theology and apologetics, hence the apologetics 101 course. So I'm hoping to continue those studies into a master's in theology uh, shortly after my internship here. So anyways, yeah, thank you so much. Uh, I'll be around after the service too. If you guys want to chat, I'd love to get to know uh, each and every one of you. To end this, I'm going to invite Malachi to come on up and read the scripture for the day. Thank you. Uh, please stand if you're able for the reading of God's word. This is Ephesians 3, 7 through 13. Of this gospel, I was made a minister according to gift to the gift of God's grace, which was given me by the working of his power. To me, though I am the very least of all the saints, this grace was given to preach the Gentiles the unsearchable riches of Christ and to bring to light for everyone what is the plan of the mystery hidden for ages in God who created all things. So that through the church, the manifold wisdom of God might now be made known to the rulers and authorities in the heavenly places. This was according to the eternal purpose that he has realized in Christ Jesus our Lord, in whom we have boldness and access with confidence through our faith in him. So I ask you not to lose heart over what I am suffering for you, which is your glory. Thank you. You guys can have a seat. Have a seat. All right, let's, uh, let's pray together. Father, thank you for uh, this morning. Thank you for your word that you are uh, prepared for us in advance to be studying today. Uh, Lord, you, you have a plan for, to teach us. Holy Spirit, you have, uh, you have permission uh, from us. Come and, and bring conviction to our hearts. Show us the things that we need to see and help us to understand the things that we need to understand. And we ask for that in the name of Jesus this morning. Amen. Amen. All right, cool. So um, two weeks ago, Rosh Hashanah, uh, which is uh, the Jewish New Year. So it literally means the head of the year. Rosh is, is Hebrew for head. So that we, uh, this, this beginning of the Jewish New Year just kicks off several festivals, several um, things that they are, that are in their calendar. So uh, it actually kicks off the 10 days of awe that lead to Yom Kippur, which we uh, celebrated last Sunday. And we spent some time as a congregation um, confessing and, and doing some repentance before the Lord, because that's what it, 
Yom Kippur is all about. It's the day of atonement. And I explained a little bit of, the, of that from Leviticus and how the sacrifices that they performed on that day to make, to make, a, uh, to make sacrifice for the, the people's sin. And, uh, and after that, five days after Yom Kippur is Sukkot. And Sukkot is the Feast of Tabernacles. So Jewish people are celebrating the Feast of Tabernacles and they actually build these tents they build these three-sided structures, and they, they remind themselves uh, uh, during this, uh, about uh, the time in their history when they were wandering in the wilderness, and how God had a tent too, and it was in the center of their community, and he dwelled with them. So they will eat their meals out there for the week. Uh, they'll sleep out there. Uh, it's kind of a national camping day uh, for Jewish people, um, at just remembering their history. For us as believers, it reminds us that, that God dwells with us now. Um, now, that we, uh, now that we know Jesus, we know the Messiah has come, he is with us and he dwells in us. Uh, actually, the word Emmanuel in Hebrew is, it means God with us, literally. Im is with, nu is us, and El, Emmanuel, El is short for Elohim. So with us God. That's what it means literally. And so just think about that. I try and bring those things uh, to mind, the, the Hebrew calendar for us, because it's part of our heritage as Christians. Um, and, it, and it has such a rich meaning for us today in light of Jesus, in light of the Savior, um, who, uh, as we look at, at the New Testament, we find that it explains a lot of the Old Testament. And the things in the Old Testament, uh, there are things hidden there, that, that we see are explained in the New Testament. So it's a, it's a cool, cool thing. I'll keep bringing those things uh, to mind as we go through the, the calendar year. Let's start where I always start, my introduction. It's always the same every week. I, I, I am purposefully doing this because I want you to be able to tell me back, what is it that we're doing as a church? What is it in this season that God is calling us to do? Okay, and we're kind of getting around the idea of Acts 2.42, that they devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching, to prayer, and to the breaking of bread. So we want to, we're, we're devoting ourselves to the book of Ephesians, to the apostle Paul's teachings, and we're going to it week after week with the focus of saying, Lord, we want to be made new in the attitude of our minds. We want the Bible to so uh, saturate our thoughts that we think differently, and hopefully then we behave differently. And as Paul encourages us in Ephesians 4, 1, that we live in a manner worthy of the gospel. That's the point. That's why we're studying it. But we're, we're also devoting ourselves to prayer, and we're praying for a couple of things as a congregation. One, God, show us what you want us to do. You're the head, we're the body, and so the, the chief and principal job of the body is to know what the head wants so that we can do that. We don't want to just be, you know, doing this, you know, not connected to the head. We want to function as we're designed to function as a church. So that way, um, we're able to accomplish what God wants us to accomplish. So we're praying, we're crying out to God, God, show us what you want us to do. Lead us in this season. We want to be led by you. And then the other thing is, God, give us opportunities to share the love of Christ through the gospel, through communicating to people the good news of Jesus. That's what we want to be about. And I'm praying for you. I'm praying that you have opportunities to share the gospel. I was meeting with somebody this week and they were telling me their story and they said, you know what? I just got to a point in my life where I was searching for God. And it, what that reminded me is that there are people out there who are searching for God. They're actively searching for God and they need someone to explain to them the answer that we have, the message that we've been given they don't know it, but they so desperately want to hear it. And I think sometimes we get frustrated in our, in our evangelism because we think that, man, every person that I'm going to go to, is, it's going to be an argument. It's going to be hard. I'm going to be rejected. But the reality is that, that there is fruit that is ripe for salvation out there. Uh, I think about Bobby a couple weeks ago. Man, we prayed for that. We prayed specifically. God let somebody call. Let somebody call. And they called that week. And then 
through a series of him reading a book. He sits in my living room and we're having a spiritual conversation. He just stops me and says, hey, can we pray right now? Can you help me pray to receive Christ? And I'm like, I haven't even told you my testimony yet. But okay, yeah, let's go. Let's do this. You know, Let's pray right now for you to receive Christ. He was that ready. So if you're timid, if, you're, if you feel like, oh, I'm just not bold enough, man, just pray. God, send me somebody who's ripe, ripe, who's seeking uh, to know the gospel. Um, and that's what we're going to talk about uh, this morning. I'm going to go back through the text uh, that Malachi just read for us. I'm going to add my commentary from, uh, from my translation. So let's look at Ephesians 3, 7 through 13. And Paul starts with, of this gospel. And I'm just going to stop right there. That's, we're going to talk about two things today. One of them is the gospel. So as a result of today, we want to know more about the gospel. We want to know more about what it is. All right. Of this gospel, I was made a minister or a servant. Paul considered, considers himself a waiter or like a king's servant, according to the gift of God's grace, which has been given me by the working of his power to me though I am the very least of all the saints, and that's literally translated, I'm lesser than the least. Or if leaster was a word, he would probably use it there. I'm the leaster of all of the saints. This grace was given me to preach to the Gentiles. And again, that word is ethnon or ethnos, to the nations, the unsearchable or the unfathomable or the mysterious riches of Christ. And to bring to light, the word in the Greek is phos, to enlighten, to, to illuminate for everyone. What is the plan of the mystery hidden for the ages in God who created all things? So that through the church, the manifold wisdom of God, and that's the second thing we're going to talk about today. I told you a couple, uh, last week, uh, I don't know what that means, but I'm going to show up today and figure out uh, what the manifold wisdom of God is. M might be made known or revealed to the rulers and authorities in the heavenly places. This was according to the eternal purpose or the eternal plan that he has realized in Christ Jesus our Lord, in whom we have boldness. And that word is forwardness, forwardness with God. The, the Athenians were actually, uh, this, this literal word in, in Greek was, was applied to the Athenians because they had such candor in their speech that they often crossed the line. They often misuse their frankness. They needed a filter. But, but Paul is saying, because of God's eternal purpose, we can have that kind of frankness to go into the presence of God and access this freedom to approach him at any time. That's what we've been given with confidence through our faith in him. So I ask you not to lose heart, not to become weary, not to become discouraged over what I'm suffering for you, which is your glory the glorification that you are experiencing as new creations in Christ. So Paul last week talked about this word mystery and he used it three times. I'm just going to remind us a little bit about what he was talking about. The mystery is not mysticism and it's not something that's indescribable, but it's not just something you feel. A mystery described in the New Testament is a truth that because of its character can never be attained or arrived at merely by the unaided human intellect or ability. And that's Dr. Martin Lloyd-Jones. Let me read it again. This is his definition of what a mystery is in the New Testament. It is a truth that because of its character, and the character means is it, it's the part of its character is that it belongs to God. This is God's truth. That truth can never be attained or arrived at merely by the unaided human intellect or ability. We need help. We need revelation. And Paul states the mystery in verse 6. He says, this, this is the mystery that the Gentiles, the nations, are fellow heirs. They're members of the same body and partakers of the promise in Christ Jesus through the gospel. All right. So he, ends, he ended last week saying all of this through the gospel. And then he starts this week of this gospel. All right. So we're going to talk about the gospel this morning. But before I get to that point, I, last week I I left out a really important uh, scripture in Acts that talked about how Paul gained this mystery through revelation. So I told you the story about Paul on the road to Damascus, and, and he's, he's walking along, and Jesus reveals himself in a, in a blinding light. And he says to Paul, G, Paul says, who are you, 
Lord. And he says, I'm Jesus who you're persecuting. Well, in Acts uh, 26, 16, Paul explains to Agrippa more of that conversation that he had with Jesus, because Jesus actually continues speaking there. And this is what he says to Paul after he says, I'm Jesus who you're persecuting. He says, but rise and stand upon your feet. This is Jesus talking to Paul. For I have appeared to you for this purpose, to appoint you as a servant and a witness to the things in which you have seen, uh, in which you have seen me now, and those things in which I will appear to you at a later time delivering you from your people and from the Gentiles to whom I am sending you. So he's, he's already speaking about conflict that is, is going to happen. He's, I'm sending you to these Gentiles and to your own people, and I'm also going to deliver you from them. And here's the purpose. It's to open their eyes so that they may turn from darkness to light and from the power of Satan to God, that they may receive forgiveness of sins and a place among those who are sanctified by faith in me. So he's saying, to the Jews and to the Gentiles, I'm sending you so that they may receive forgiveness and a place among those who are sanctified by faith in me. So it's pretty clear what God, what Jesus was asking him to do. Okay? It wasn't a mystery, but it, in, in that it was vague. It was a mystery because suddenly it was revealed, this is the plan that I have. This is what I want for you to do, Paul. And Paul is so convinced of this that he's willing to suffer imprisonment. And bookending last week's verse 1, I, Paul, for this reason, I, Paul, a prisoner of Christ Jesus. And then the end of our passage this week saying, I don't want you to become weary. I don't want you to become discouraged because I'm suffering as I am because it's for your glory, right? The church is drawn into the glory of the unsearchable riches of Christ through the suffering of Christ's ministers and through his missionaries. And we see this starting with Paul. And all Paul is doing is that he is imitating Christ who establishes his kingdom in the very same way. His work, our work, is cruciform. Or as some people around here like to say, it means dying to live, right? We're willing to sacrifice our lives so that others can know the gospel and so that they can live. But through the gospel and of this gospel, what is the gospel? <clears throat> you know, I, it would be interesting to, to just pass out note cards in here and, and have you write out, the gospel is dot, 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 and fill it in. And just see... What, what we know of the gospel. It's, it's this word that's kicked around in churches all the time. Um, <clears throat> and Paul in 1 Corinthians 15 kind of sums up what the gospel is in the most succinct, probably, passage of scripture that we have. And he says this, Now I would remind you, brothers, of the gospel I preach to you, which you have received in which you stand and by which you are being saved, if you hold fast to the word I preach to you, unless you believed in vain. And here it is. For I delivered to you as of first importance what I received. This is, this is the, the most important thing that I could, could deliver to you, that Christ died for our sins in accordance with the Scriptures, that he was buried, and that he was raised on the third day in accordance with the Scriptures. So basically, Paul is saying Christ died for sins, he was buried, he rose from the dead on the third day, just as it was foretold. That's the gospel. The gospel is the good news. That's what it means. Gospel means good news. That God became a man in Jesus, that he lived the life that we should have lived. He lived perfectly. We couldn't do it. So he had to come and live that life perfectly to become the perfect sacrifice for us and to die the death that we should have died because death was our penalty. He took our place. And three days later, he rose from the dead, and he proved that he's the Son of God, and that he offered, or he could offer us the gift of salvation to all who would repent and believe in him. Simply put, Christ died for sinners to make peace with God. That's what the gospel means. In the Greek, the word is euangelion, and that word um, for the Greek people meant it was similar to a or or it describes the proclamation of a king a victorious king on the battlefield 
And this, he would send his messenger out to declare victory. Stop fighting. And it was good news because they got to stop fighting because the war was won. And this victorious king would send out the messenger and say, I, I've won. I've won the day. You can put down your weapons. In the case of Jesus, it's good news because he declares not only that he's won, but he declares to the, loser, the losers that he comes and he brings peace. This king, this victorious king is bringing us peace. But what does it mean for us to repent and believe, okay? So how do you respond to this gospel? How do you receive this gospel? What are we calling people to? We're calling them to repentance and to believe. Um, repentance is, is a turning from sin, right? It's a realization through the gospel that we are living our lives in a way that is apart from, that is offensive to God, that we're enemies of God. And in that understanding, we realize, hey, you know what? I don't want to, I don't want to be like that anymore. I want to turn from my sin. It means that we believe in Christ in faith and we confess him as our Lord, our Savior, Master, the King of our lives. And it means that we trust his work on the cross for our salvation, for our forgiveness, and we live our lives to bring him glory. Okay, that's what it means to, to respond to the gospel. And the implications of, of that decision, man, they, they affect every part of our lives. I mean, the gospel, the, the, the understanding, the good news, the message that Jesus has come and he's purchased my redemption, that he's forgiven me of my sins, that now I, I'm no longer guilty, but I am I'm set free. I've been set free by somebody who took the penalty for me. So therefore, I owe him everything. And if I owe him everything, that means every part of my life belongs to him. That means the gospel crashes into our thinking and into our worldview, and it begins to change it. It means that the, the, the gospel crashes into our identity and our behaviors, and it begins to change those things as well. It means that the gospel crashes into our relationships and our finances, and we begin to behave differently in those arenas. It means it changes our career and our vocation, what we do in life. It changes our politics. It changes families. It changes everything. Because we no longer belong to ourselves. We belong to another. And so we should live our lives in a way that reflects Him, because he purchased us. He, we are his now. That's what the gospel means. The gospel affects everything. We never, and here's another thing, we never grow beyond the gospel as believers. So in one respect, you could say, well, I kind of think I know what the gospel means. You know, yeah, I, I've heard this. So I, I grew up in Sunday school. I get it, Bart. I know what the gospel is. But the gospel is not just for varsity-level Christians. It's for all of us. The gospel is actually the thing that fuels our sanctification. It's the motivation that, 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 that daily energizes us to live differently. The Holy Spirit uses it in a way to bring conviction to our hearts over sin and then teaches us to live in a different way, and the gospel motivates us. It's the fuel that, that burns within us to live differently. Uh, probably the best um, illustration that I've ever heard of sanctification is um, of, of, a, of a radar, right? So when we become Christians, um, we, we actually don't... Um, we, we, when we become Christians... We become aware of things. Let, let's put it that way. And it's kind of like a radar. You have the radar, you know, screen there. There's a circle and it has this sweeping like dial that goes around. And I don't know about you, but when I, I became a Christian, the Holy Spirit started to bring conviction and things started to pop up on my radar that were, that were offensive to God, you know? So, and there were a lot of them too. It was kind of like beep, 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 beep. And I was like, oh my goodness. You know, and conviction is coming, and, it, and every time, every day, you know, that sweeping around, it seemed like there was something on the radar that I was confessing and saying, oh, Lord, I, you know, change me. 
And, and slowly those would be, you know, kind of fade away, you know, as God began to change me, he would do that. And so it was like, beep, beep, I'm still working, beep. It's like, oh, praise God, you know, you're changing me, beep, you know, and slowly there's, it's becoming more and more silent. The thing about a radar is there's a range knob right by the, right by the, the, the viewfinder thing. And, and it seems like as we grow in maturity, God takes that range knob and he kind of dials it up a little bit. And suddenly we're able to see more of our lives. And there's more things, you know, and suddenly I feel like I'm back to the beginning where it's like beep, 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 beep. And I'm like, oh, Lord, I thought I'd come so far, but now I'm realizing there's so, I have a lot farther to go. And he's bringing those things up. And it just seems like that's my Christian life, is that I'm, I'm watching and God is, through his Holy Spirit, is bringing conviction in my life. And he keeps increasing the range keeps bringing things to light. And the gospel becomes that fuel that keeps me going. I'm glad that God doesn't like just crank the range knob all the way up to full because, you know, the, it would be one solid beep uh, for me all day long and, uh, and I would get discouraged. But he starts small with us and then he begins to show us more and more and more. And the gospel just becomes this thing that continues to fuel me continues to remind myself when I preach that to myself, when I remind myself of the gospel, that he, what he did for me means that I owe him everything, my whole life. And when he brings those things to mind, I go, yes, Lord. Yes, I want to walk in your ways. I want to die to those things. And I want to become yours more and more and more. Um, the other, the, the last thing I want to say about the gospel is that I think for us as Christians, we need to be able to articulate the gospel well, okay? Not just for ourselves and for our own souls and for our own sanctification, but for, for uh, because God calls us on mission to, and he gives us the message and he calls us uh, his ambassadors of reconciliation. That God is actually making an appeal through us to people to reconcile them, to God and man together. And so we need to be able to articulate it well and be able to, to tell people of the good news of the gospel. Um, a couple weeks ago, we, we talked about, um, it came up, I think in our response time, we were talking about maybe, maybe churches are a little bit too dramatic ethnically. And, uh, I, you know, as I'm going through this and hearing Paul say, you know, the mystery of, of the gospel that, that I have been given is that I, the, the nations, it's the nations, that everyone, all, all peoples, all ethnicities are now able to come and be united with Christ. And, and that may be something that God is calling you. You feel like Paul, you feel that burning of like, yes, our church should be like that. And if that's, if that's, if that's you, man, I would say begin to pray for that begin to ask God, begin to develop diverse relationships with people around you, and then apply the gospel to it and see what God does. Build on this foundation of the apostles and the prophets that God has laid, and let's build on that together. Of course, he's the one who draws. He's the one who, who, who gives new life, but let's pursue it together, just like Paul would have done. And and, and for you ladies who are studying Psalm, let me, just, let me just give you a little bit of Psalm 2 this morning. Because the father says to the son, he says, ask of me and I will make the nations your heritage. Isn't that beautiful? To the ends of the earth, they, they will be your possession. Uh, and then if I look into Isaiah, Isaiah 2, since Isaiah is here, I'm going to quote a lot from Isaiah this morning. Isaiah 2, it's, it talks about the mountain of God and the nations streaming up to it. And they say together, come, let us go to the mountain of the Lord that we may walk in his paths. And he may teach us his ways and that we may, uh, so let's go to the house of Jacob. It's beautiful. In Isaiah 11, uh, it says that in that day, the root of Jesse who shall stand as a signal for all peoples. Of him shall the nations inquire, and his resting place shall be glorious. Or Isaiah 42, I am the Lord, I've called you in righteousness, talking about his servant. I will take you by the hand and I will keep you. I will give you as a covenant for the people 
a light for the nations, right? It's, it's, it was hidden in plain sight in the scriptures all along that God's heart was for all of his creation. So, so the house of the Lord shall be established and all the nations shall stream to it, shall flow to it, Isaiah 2. Of him, Christ, shall the nations inquire, Isaiah 11. And I will give you Jesus as a light to the nations, Isaiah 42. The gospel is for everyone. It is for all nations. So if that's what God is calling us to be, is to be a people who represent all nations, let's begin to pray for that. Let's begin to seek that in our relationships. Let's, let's begin to foster those relationships and then apply the gospel to it. Now, Paul says this Leaster comment, and I just want to pause here before we move on to the manifold wisdom of God to, to talk about the Leaster. He says, to me, though I am the least of all the saints, or he says in 1 Timothy 5, uh, Jesus came and to save sinner, sinners, which I am the great, or I am the chief, or the foremost. Paul is really, really humble as he talks about himself and as he is given this message to preach the gospel. In the back of his mind, he's thinking, you know what? I'm a persecutor of the church. There's no way that I should have been given this, this ministry, and yet I have. And so he goes with humility. It reminds me of 1 Peter 3, 5 that says, in your, in your hearts, honor Christ as Lord. Always be prepared to make a defense to everyone who asks you for this reason, for your hope that is in you, yet with gentleness and respect. So Paul applies humility. Listen to what uh, Charles Spurgeon says. He says, many who now shine in the highest places of self-estimation will one day be glad enough to sit at the feet of the poorest of the saints. Unless I'm greatly mistaken, for everyone who exalts himself shall be humbled. For my part, I had no sooner hear Paul say that he was the less, that he was less than the least of all the saints, than I would hear the holiest brother out of heaven say that he had been living without sin. Paul was as holy as the holiest now upon earth. But among the humble, he was the most humble. May the Lord make us just like him. Man, Paul was a man of deep humility. But, but not, just, not just in relation to the gospel. I think he was a humble man in relation to, to Jesus. He lived his life in humility. He lived his life always remembering where he came from and what he, what he had done, what God had saved him from. Do you? Do you remember what God saved you from? Do you recount all of the things, the many things, there's so many things that he's forgiven you for? That changes the way that we act towards one another. Changes the way that we communicate the gospel. We're not trying to be smart. We're not trying for others to look at us and think we're smart. We're not trying to prove something. We're trying to persuade people that God loves them. Paul brings humility, and we should communicate in that same way. So the summary of the passage is that Paul has been given the gospel and he is the least among all the saints. And he has been given the task of preaching the unsearchable riches of Christ, which is the good of the good news. Man, it's good news. They are inheriting uh, all the promises of God. The, the Messiah has come and all of the promises are being fulfilled uh, to them. He is saving them from their sins. That's the good of the good news, the unsearchable riches of Christ. But he's also bringing light to everyone what is the plan of the mystery hidden in the ages for God. This is the news, right? This is the, it's news because nobody knew it before. If they knew it, it wouldn't be news, right? But this is the good news. And he's, he's doing this so that the manifold wisdom of God, the superior wisdom of God, the infinite wisdom of God, would be displayed to cosmic forces 
through the church. This is about God's glory. Let me find my second little note card that I have hidden up here. Isaiah 48. Again, Isaiah. Such a great book. Isaiah 42, 8. I am the Lord. That is my name. And I will give my glory to no other. This is about God's glory. His manifold wisdom being displayed. Now, manifold, that word there, is, is a word that expresses multicolored, like a tapestry, or multifaceted, like a diamond. It's complex. It's rich. It is, <clears throat> it is hard to explain. It's God's wisdom. Um, Isaiah 55, 8 says, For my thoughts are higher than your thoughts, or my thoughts are not your thoughts, neither are my ways are your ways my ways, declares the Lord. For as the heavens are higher than the earth, so my ways are higher than yours, and my thoughts are higher than your thoughts. When we talk about God's manifold wisdom, we're talking about God in the way that he thinks, in his plan and in his purposes. Listen to Isaiah 40 that says, Who has directed the spirit of the Lord or informed him as his counselor? Or Romans 11, Oh, the depth and the riches and the wisdom and the knowledge of God. How unsearchable are his judgments, how inscrutable his ways. For who has known the mind of the Lord and who has been his counselor? God's wisdom is being displayed. And who is it being displayed for? It's being displayed to the rulers and authorities. Now, we've heard this phrase before in Ephesians. Chapter 1, Christ is seated at the right hand in the heavenly realms, far above all rule and authority, power and dominion. Chapter 2 refers to Satan as the ruler of the kingdom of the air. He's the ruler of this kingdom that has powers and authorities and dominions, rulers. And in chapter, chapter 6, we'll get to rulers, authorities, powers of this dark world and spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly realms. Paul is using this kind of language to refer to what we might identify as demonic or evil forces. And God is saying, I'm going to take my manifold wisdom and I'm going to put it on display to these forces. Um, this term is also used in Colossians 2.15, where it says that Christ disarmed the rulers and authorities and put them to open shame by triumphing, triumphing over them in him on the cross. He put them to open shame. So I'm thinking about, I'm thinking about this manifold wisdom of God, his plan that could not be thwarted. Even though these evil forces went against him, they said, you know what? We'll kill the son. We studied that in Luke 20 uh, this week in the men's group about this parable that Jesus gave about this, these tenants and the landowner. And he sends messengers and they keep beating them and sending them back. And he says, you know what? I'll send my son. I'll send my son to them. They'll listen to him. And they, they see the son coming and they say, you know what? Let's kill him. And then we can take his inheritance. And then the question is asked, well, what will the landowner do to those evil tenants? See, that's these forces. These forces arrayed against God's plan. They tried their worst. They did their best. But even in coming against him, it's like God was like an infinite number of moves ahead of them. If they were playing chess. They lost when they sat down because God had already won. And in the church and through the church, which is the result of what Christ has done, right? He is, he is uh, he's killed, he's buried, he's resurrected, he ascends to heaven, and then on Pentecost, he establishes the church. And so now the church stands as this reminder, as proof that he's won, he's victorious. And I began to think about that, and I went, went wow, that's awesome. We're like, we're like this, we're like in the spiritual realms, this place, this gathering 
is a reminder to spiritual forces that God's wisdom is unstoppable. And then I went, wait, that means they may not like us. Hmm. And so I began to think about that and, and go to the scriptures, uh, like in 1 Timothy 4.1, where the Spirit clearly says that in the latter times, some will abandon the faith and follow deceiving spirits and things taught by demons. Some will abandon the faith. Some that we're, we were going to church with, they're deceived by these forces. Or externally, if you look in Revelations 2.10, to one of the churches, Paul or John writes, he says, do not fear what you are about to suffer. Beware the devil is about to throw some of you in prison so that you may be tested for 10 days. You will have affliction, but be faithful unto death, and I will give you the crown of life. Man, man. So I'm, I'm thinking about that, and, 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 I, and, and I go, well, God, what, what do we do with, with this passage? How do, what does it mean for us today? We talked about the gospel today and knowing the gospel. We talked about this manifold wisdom of God and what, that, what the implications are for this gathering in the spiritual realm. So here are the two things uh, that I think it means for us. One, um, the gospel is a spiritual message of good news that has, is supernatural in its power to transform us. That's what the, the gospel is. It's a message that has been given to us as the church. And we are made ambassadors of reconciliation. God is making his appeal through us. So, how familiar are you with the gospel? Think about that. I would encourage you this week just to take a, a little piece of paper and write, the gospel is. And, and begin to write. It may take you, you know, several sentences, maybe a, a good, healthy paragraph. Maybe you'll bring in some of the things we talked about this morning, maybe some things that you already know, but just kind of write it out. And then take it to somebody that, that you know, maybe somebody in your family and say, hey, I'm trying to, what do you think about this? Can you read this? Am I missing anything? I mean, think about somebody who maybe doesn't know the gospel. Would this, would this answer their questions, or would this be a good starting place? Just do that. It's a little bit of homework this week, all right? Or, or if you have a family and you have kids, man, this is a great topic for the dinner table. Sit around the table and say, hey, guys, let's talk about what the gospel is. Let's just throw things out. What do you think the gospel is? Let me hear your thought. I want to hear what, what, what your understanding of that is. And let's talk about it together. Man, what a great family thing to do. Or even more, if you want to up the difficulty, write it out or don't write it out. Talk to somebody who maybe doesn't go to church, maybe a coworker, and tell them, ask them this question. Hey, I'm trying to figure out, I'm trying to, trying to understand what people what people understand, what, what people's understanding of the word gospel is. Because I hear that thrown around a lot. And do you know what that means? What would you say the gospel is? Because I help me out with this. And just see what they say. And 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 encourage them. Say, if there are some things in there that you haven't thought about, say, man, that's that's actually pretty good. I, I like that. I like what you said right there. That's good. Because I'm trying to write this out and and trying to get a definition for myself. The second thing is, is to, for us to think and to be aware of the spiritual implications of what our gathering is. That we are, that through us, the manifold wisdom of God is being displayed to demonic forces, to forces that are arrayed against God, evil forces. The topic of spiritual warfare in Ephesians has already started. We haven't got to six yet, right? But we're already talking about it. We're already thinking about it because we've been given spiritual life in Christ. That means that we've been born into a spiritual realm and we're seated with Christ in the heavenly places and he has dominion over all of these forces. And we're seated beside him, which means if they are arrayed against him, they're also arrayed against us. And like I said, that made me start to think. But the more I started to think, then I started to think, 
well, you know what? I don't really have anything to be afraid of, though. Because as much as they are against us, God is for us. As much as they don't like what we represent, oh, he loves what we represent. Because he is glorified in us. Think about that. Think about how God is glorified, how we represent his victory, how we represent that his plan was unstoppable, and how he must have great joy in that, it, have great joy in us, okay? But that does mean that we do need to be aware that there is a conflict that we've been introduced into, okay, in a spiritual realm, and we need to begin to pray. We need to pray. Second Corinthians 10 Three through five, I'm going to finish up with this. Though we walk in the flesh, we are not waging war according to the flesh. You hear that? Though we walk in physical bodies, in a physical war world, we do not wage war here. It's spiritual. Though the weapons of our warfare are not of the flesh, but have divine power to destroy strongholds, and we destroy arguments and every lofty opinion raised against the knowledge of God. Why? Because it's less. Because it's not, it can't come against God. It can't defeat his wisdom. His wisdom is higher. His wisdom is greater. And we take every thought captive to obey Christ. Not just those that we hear, but those that enter into our minds. Right? Because we want to be transformed in the attitude of our minds. That's why we're studying Ephesians. Lord, transform us. We want to understand your wisdom. We want to understand your ways. Can you reveal that to us? That's what we need. That's what we want. So I'll end as I have been ending. Today, if you hear his voice, do not harden your hearts as in the rebellion. Speaking of the children of Israel, when they heard the voice of God and they rebelled against him, the writer of Hebrews says, don't do that. You can, it is possible to hear the voice of God and in your pride and in your rebellion say, I'm not going to do that. That's not for me. That's for somebody else. And yet we're encouraged. The writer of Hebrews is saying, if you hear his voice today, do it. Follow him. And if you've been hearing about this great salvation of God through Jesus Christ week after week, and you're ready to make that step of faith in him today, to surrender your life to him, to find forgiveness and redemption, to follow him as the Lord of your life, just talk to me. Talk to me after this. I never know who's going to come through that door. And I'm praying that God would send people who need to hear the gospel and hear this truth and, and receive this salvation. So you'll hear me week after week make that plea. Come and talk to me. Today is the day of salvation. If you hear his voice, let's talk. Let's pray. Father, thank you for this uh, message today. Lord, help us to understand the gospel, Lord, and what it means for us. To understand it more and more in, in a way that it, that it fuels our, our desire for you, our pursuit of you, God. How, how rich it is, how wonderful it is to hear that, that you loved me, that you saved me, that you redeemed me, that you forgave me, and that you purchased me with your blood and I'm yours. What a wonderful thing to be reminded of right now today. No matter what I've done, no matter what I've thought, no matter how far, far I've fallen, God, you have redeemed. Thank you, Jesus. I want to be yours. I want to follow you. And then, Lord, help us to understand what it means. Help us to understand what it means that the church is, is a display of your manifold wisdom, of your plan, your eternal purpose, God, that you accomplished for us. <laughs> and yeah, that, that may bring some heat, God, but, but Lord, we rest in you and we look to you because you're greater and you're better. And Lord, we pray that we would bring you great joy in who we are. We pray that in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. All right. Good, good, good. Next week, we're going to jump into Paul's, another of Paul's uh, prayers for the Ephesian people. And it's going to be really, really good. But let's talk a, about what you heard today. 
talk about things that stuck, stood out um, and things that maybe you went, ah, oh, I haven't thought about that or something maybe that God is asking you to do um, as a result of the message today. So let's, who's going to kick us off? Yes, Alicia. Right. Sure. Yeah. Yeah. Sure. Man, that that is that is great. Great question. Let me try and repeat it back to you for the people out there who are listening. So Alicia is saying, you know, thinking about what we're calling people to and just kind of in the own realizing the reality of your sanctification process and how you, you go, well, maybe that's not really that encouraging to people to hear that story of my struggle as I'm moving, you know, closer and closer to God as he's working in me. So how, how is that? Uh, you said it's the re- for the rest of your life, you know, it's like, how is this encouraging? How is this um, good news, right? Well, it is great news. You know why it's great news? And this is why we need to remind ourselves of the gospel is because he counted you worthy. He saw you as you were, Alicia, and he loved you. He knew at the beginning how you would struggle. And he still said yes to you. And see, that's the thing that, man, we all know the depths of our sin. Nobody else does, but we do. I know what I've done. And the reality that God loves me now, and he loved me then, and he loved me in the midst of that, is so powerful. It is such good news. And you think about the Apostle Paul, and he says, I'm the chief of all sinners because I was so against him. I was killing the ones that he loved, and yet he chose me. He called me his own. There was still grace enough for me. And if he could do that for me, I know he could do that for you. And that's a powerful message. That is so powerful. And that's something that we need to remind ourselves. In the midst of our failure, we need to remind ourselves of that. When we are looking at our sin, And the accuser comes and he reminds us when it's fresh, when our rebellion is still, still warm. God says, I love you. And you haven't stopped being mine. And I can forgive even now. Man, that is powerful. 
that is powerful. And he says, more than that, and I can still use you. And I still have great plans for you. And this isn't the end. This is not the end. I'm working in you. I'm the one who started this work. I'm the one who's going to complete it. Because I'm faithful and true. Man, what a message. I mean, I'm... Whew. All right. Thank you. Thank you for that question. Yes. That's the depth of understanding that we need to get to about the gospel. It needs to bring tears to our eyes. It needs to just... It just needs to shatter us and just go, how, how can it be that you would love me? How could it be? Awesome. Anybody in Zoom? Okay, so two, two responses there. One, Sean, talking about how, uh, how God uses a flawed people to reach flawed people. That he could, he could just reveal himself to people directly. And that's true. But see, we get to, we get to participate. This is, this is how wonderful our God is. He knows that we're going to experience joy, the joy that he experiences. And he wants to incorporate us in it. He wants us to participate with that. And so, so he allows us into that process. I mean, he's doing it. He is doing it. But we're a part of that process. So what, what a great a responsibility that we have. And that, then Sean went on to say that the, the church, you know, is, is also flawed. But it displays the manifold wisdom of God. And I don't know how that happens. Um, because, because how is that manifold wisdom? I, well, I guess, I guess, I guess God's plan, his eternal plan and purpose is being accomplished. Is it completed yet? I would say not yet, not yet. But it is on track and nothing is stopping it. And just like I said to Alicia, the, the one who started the work will be faithful to complete it. So the end result is sure. Now, to Brian's comment of, you know, that, that is an amazing reality, but what, what it, how about the reality of people who get hurt by the church? And uh, because that's a reality. That's our present reality. And I think, I think yeah, I, it, it, that is a sad reality. That's why Paul wrote Ephesians uh, 2 to point out that we are united with Christ and then we're united to one another. And there should be Christ is our peace. He didn't say Christ eliminates all the sin because we are sinful people. And I, I sadly would say to you what my mentor said to me in, in, in my first round of seminary. He said, you know, if you stick around here long enough, I'm going to sin against you. And he said, I'm sorry for that. He said, but I'm a fallen person. And I'll say something or I'll do something and it will be hurtful to you. And he said, and when that happens, when that happens, don't leave. Stay. Work it out. It's worth it. It's worth it. And some, some of that, some people would say, well, you don't know how great I've been hurt. And I would say, no, I probably don't. But Jesus not only died to forgive us of our sins, but to take away the sin that we've committed and the sin that's been committed against us. Christ is our peace. 
And he does work in that way. And, and reconcilia reconciliation is possible. It's hard. It is so hard to walk in the way of reconciliation. But through Christ, I believe it's possible. And so I would echo my mentor and say, don't leave. Don't run away. Don't choose what's, what's easy. Stick it out. I would say that to people who are struggling in their marriages as well. Don't leave. Work it out. I know that there's pain. I know that the, there's, there's heartache. But I believe in a God who restores and who's greater. Do you believe? Do you believe in that God? When it really matters, does our faith in Christ push us through those storms, through that hurt, to the other side where we are brothers again? I believe in that. I believe in that. And it pains me when I see sin in the church, when I see pain in the church, when I see people hurt each other, because I know that that's not what God wants. And ultimately, that will be taken away, but we're not there yet. We're not there yet. But I believe. I believe. Maybe that answers the question, hopefully. Yes? Okay, cool. Oh, awesome, awesome. So John posted an invitation on Seed Life to post your, what you think the gospel means. That's great. Yeah, and if you can make it succinct in one sentence, you know, take that challenge. I used to say in, in seminary, explain that deep theological concept in five words or less, because that's my understanding level. Five words or less help me understand, uh, you know, superlapsarianism. And they would go, I can't do it. So anyway, I, I challenge you. If you, can, if you can make it succinct or if you can make it, make it as long as you want. Um, let's see what comes out. Cool. Anything else? Yes. Yes. Yeah. Yeah, how, are, how aware are we of the, the range knob in my radar analogy? That's what, what uh, Scott and Maggie are, are, I'm assuming that maybe that's Scott, maybe it's Maggie. Um, that's a, I, I don't know. You know, every illustration kind of fails at some point. Um, I just know that he's doing it, you know? I just, as I, grow, as I grow in my relationship with Christ and as I grow in my understanding of the Word of God, I'm just aware of more stuff. You know, I read through, uh, through the scriptures and, and he brings something to, to light. You know, and it's like, I never saw that before. I never understood that before. And on my radar, it's bing. <laughs> bing. Yeah, what are you going to do with that, Bart? Bing. And I just think the more that we press into God, the more that we pursue him, the more that we follow him, the more that we are active in our faith the more he's going to bring stuff up and that's a good thing that's a good thing that means he, what was the scripture says that he disciplines those who he loves he's showing us that he loves us because he's saying hey you know what that needs to change so that you can grow more and more into the image and the likeness of my son not completely that's someday but closer and closer i want you to be ready for heaven more ready than you are now. So let's work that process. Somebody else had something over here, maybe? Well said. That's it? Okay. All right. Danny says, well said. All right. Okay, well, if you have kids then... Oh, wait, wait, one more. No, no, go ahead. Yes. 
So I, I, will, I, would, I would say specifically uh, going to the Colossians passage where, it's, where it, it uses that same phrase talking about him putting them to open shame. I don't think that he's doing that with angelic forces. Uh, and then I would also use the context of Ephesians to talk about that. But you're, you're right. First, first Peter, I'm going to turn there. First Peter. So, so uh, the question was, is how do I, how do I know that uh, rulers and authorities are specifically um, evil forces or demonic forces? So uh, 1 Corinthians one uh, twelve. Uh, or First Peter one twelve. <laughs> yes, yes, okay. And actually, I I was going to use this passage in there as well, um, just just to to demonstrate that the manifold wisdom of God is a mystery, and it's a mystery that's hidden from, from not just from mankind, but from these spiritual forces. And yeah, this, this verse says um, um, that it was revealed to them that they were not serving not themselves, but you, talking about the prophets, in the things that have now been announced to you through those who preach the good news to you by the Holy Spirit sent from heaven, things which angels long to look. So, so yes, I think that it is God's wisdom is being displayed. And it would include all the heavenly realms. So God's manifold wisdom is being displayed through the church. It's being declared to all of the heavenly realms, specifically here in what Paul is talking about in Ephesians. I believe it points to those who are opposing God um, specifically, but including angelic forces, all of the heavenly realms, those sided with God and those against but for me, as I read, read Paul and understand him in the broader context of Ephesians, I think he's specifically talking about those who are, against, who are against God in the heavenly realms. So yes, the answer is yes and. Both. Both. You are right, Brian. Oh yeah, yeah, Hosea. What what a what a uh, what a prophet not to be um, the one who's called to marry the prostitute and uh, and to go after her and and call her back and call her back and call her back and and to be to experience the shame, the heartache, the betrayal. I mean, that's what our Savior experienced from us. And yet, he still pursued. He still won us back. That is the, that's a picture of, of an unbelievable God. And that is a picture of our sin and how he sees it. So, yes, there is reconciliation there in our God. And that's what we have become ambassadors of him. God making his appeal through us with the gospel. All right. Um, James, come up, up here. If you have kids who are out there, go retrieve them so that they can experience worship with us together as we close. It's been a good uh, today. I used all of my note cards, went a little long, but